Welcome to an all-new Sunday Morning View Queue. Today, I'm going to tell you about what it's like driving a big fifth wheel and how one time I needed a metal grinder to get unstuck from a turn, cat scratch fever if I'm overweight in this rig, if you can put screws into the walls of your RV, and big changes at harvest hosts. Happy Sunday, everybody. I'm so happy to be back here with you for an all new Sunday morning view queue where I answer all your questions about full time RV life. Let me say up front, I apologize for the wind. It has been really windy out here where I'm camping and it's shaking my tripod just a little bit, so I apologize. I'm going to get to all the questions that I mentioned in the front, but first, let me tell you about some big changes at Harvest House. You're going to want to hear this this week. You might know I'm a big fan of Harvest House. If you're not familiar with it, you can pay a membership fee every year, and that gives you access to a database of 2,000 host locations. The hosts are made up of wineries and farms and really cool attractions like museums, maybe laser tag, barbecue down in the south, a whole bunch of places you wouldn't even expect. And to get access to all of those hosts right now, you pay $79 a year. It's a total steal. I have a link that I'm going to put below that gives you 15% off of that $79. Now, when you go to a host location, you can stay there overnight for free. You just let them know a day before you're coming. You can see the host locations on this great interactive map. It gives you all the information you need to know and other members' experiences with photos and reviews. And then, of course, you should go in and support that local business by spending about $20. I have seen things on the road that I would never have seen if I had not been a member of Harvest House. Now, $79 a year has been a screaming deal. But that price is going up to $99 on April 1st. In my opinion, still a screaming deal, but I wanted to tell you guys about it right now because if you lock in your membership with Harvest Hosts before April 1st, you can still get it for 79 bucks and 15% off with the code below, and that price is going to be locked in for the life of your membership. If you've ever wanted a Harvest Host membership, don't wait, get it now, it's worth it. Believe me, some of the best camping experiences I've had have been at a Harvest Host. Okay, moving on to the first question by Phoenix X. I'm going old school today wrote everything on a piece of paper. She said, I would like to ask about what it's like driving a house on wheels. What was it like driving a class B? What is it like driving a fifth wheel? And how is it to hitch and unhitch? Now, like I said in the beginning, I'm gonna share with you guys an embarrassing story I've never told you. First, let me tell you that driving a class B van was great. My class B RV was on a Sprinter chassis. It drove great, I got killer gas mileage. It was easier to maneuver on tight turns and I could get into more camping spots. But if I was driving or camping in high winds like this, I got tossed around. Now going to a fifth wheel was kind of an adjustment, except that I have it hooked up to a nice big truck. So when I'm in the truck driving, honestly, I don't even feel the rig back there. And I don't really feel the wind. Where it makes a big difference is when you're making a right-hand turn. Now, left-hand turns are not that bad, but right-hand turns you have to pull forward a little bit and think about where your wheelbase is, and then make your right turn really wide so that your wheels don't go up on the curb. And that leads to my embarrassing story. In March, I went to boondock on a friend's property, mooch docking, if you will, and he had a rural property up in the Colorado mountains in March when they get a lot of snow, like they did this last week. So he told me that the turn might be a little bit tight, but to go wide and just follow what he did. And I did that, and my truck did just fine, and the front of the rig did just fine, but the back wheels of my rig went over a little bit of snow. And then I lurched to a total halt. I was on a windy mountain road. There was traffic behind me, and thank God, the person right behind me was a cop because my butt got stuck in this windy road, was blocking all of the traffic on the right-hand side. Luckily, the cop managed all the traffic while we tried to figure out what to do. It turned out 
that underneath that snowdrift was a tree stump and a metal sign that had been knocked over before and both of those things were stuck up under my rig. Luckily, we were near my friend's property and he ran up to his house and got a metal grinder and thank God he had one. But this thing would not work plugged in to my F350, which has a 110 outlet on the dashboard. It just died. And I thought, you know, I've got a portable power station like a Jackery and we plugged the metal grinder into that. And you can see here, my friend got under my rig and literally grabbed away that stump and that metal sign and we were able to get out of the road. If we didn't have those things, I don't know what we would have done. And I'll tell you, I was pretty new with the rig. I'd had this one four months then. I learned a big lesson on taking the right hand turns. I knew that if I couldn't make the turn, I should keep going down this road and find a place to turn around. But I was going farther into the middle of nowhere and I didn't know what was up there and I didn't know where to turn around. So my bad, I just took the turn. I should have looked at it on Google Earth like I do every other time I go to a new camping spot, but because it was my friend's property, I didn't do it. So driving a fifth wheel does have its limitations. For me, hooking and unhooking has not been that difficult unless I'm in a camp spot that's really uneven. In fact, I stayed in an RV park in Woodland Park when Doug was first getting on the road. And I was out there for like two hours trying to hook up my rig with three neighbors helping because my truck was going one direction and the rig was going another. So every time the rig tried to go into the slot for the truck, one of them would fall the wrong direction. And this is when it's no fun to be on YouTube because some dude I do not even know pulled up next to us and said, Hey Robin, how long is it going to take you to hook up your rig? <laughs> Gosh, it's a mixed bag. If I wanted to be nimble and just get from place to place and I wanted to travel long distances and the gas mileage was a big deal, a B plus van is great. But if you're going to be spending longer amounts of time in a rig and you want to have a car to go into town, a fifth wheel is great. Honestly, I found that it's the right rig for me, at least for right now, but it does limit what spots I can get into. I have to tell you guys that I was just really touched by all of the well wishes that you gave me when I told you that Doug had come on the road full time with me a couple of weeks ago. You guys are so generous and I really appreciate it. Because of that, I got a lot of questions about how the big boy, my cat, did with Doug. Now, Doug was not a cat person. We've been together five years. It has taken the boy some time to warm up to Doug, especially when he first moved into the rig and it wasn't like he was there for a weekend and then left. He got a lot of looks from the boy like this. But since then, they're doing great. They're like best friends now. Hey, Mo. This is about kid ground etiquette and how to not be a jerk on the ground. But Doug, had the inevitable big boy bite because he was walking through the kitchen here the other day and the big boy was drinking out of his fountain. His tail was out and Doug stepped on his tail. Now I've done this twice and the big boy did exactly the same thing to me that he did to Doug. He lashed out and he bit the hell out of Doug's leg. So we washed it out. If you've ever been bit by a cat, you know that it stings for a couple of days. But right after that, you know, the big boy was fine. He wasn't hurt at all. But when it happened, he screamed, Doug screamed, and I screamed. <laughs> In a small space, sometimes it's hard not to do that. In my B plus rig, I had a curtain that separated my living area from my cab. And the big boy was under the curtain. And I got out of bed and I stepped on him and he put his fangs through my heel like a snake and I literally had to kick him off. He doesn't mean to do it, but if you're in a small space with a cat, this happens. Has it happened to any of you? Okay, the next one comes from Janet Bullard who commented on my Reno video. I have to tell you that the funniest comment that I got on that video was about the thumbnail where it said Reno and then my face and a bunch of little stuff that we did when we renovated the rig. And a guy said, I saw that thumbnail and I thought, cool, Robin and Doug are going to Nevada. Took me a minute. Anyway, back to Janet. Janet said, with all the changes in the rig, how did it affect your weight? Well, Janet, 
I can only assume that you're talking about the weight of the rig and not my butt because like a lot of us, COVID has made me a little bit more sedentary, but I'm working on it. I was worried about the weight. I talked to Doug and Eric about it all the time during the reno, um, but I think that this desk is about the same weight as the couch was. And then over there where we did the nook, when I pulled out the drawers in the reno, you can see that we actually cut weight out from the wood so that it wasn't just big heavy pieces in there. So I think it's about the same as it was, but I am going to go get my rig weighed, which anybody can do at like a truck stop way station, or sometimes you can find them for free on the side of the road. You just pull into one and it shows your weight up on a digital scale. Next time I do that, I will record it for you guys. This rig can handle a lot more weight than my prior rigs, obviously, but there's two of us in here now and we do have a bunch of stuff and I wanna make sure that I'm not overweight because it can be dangerous. I'll tell you the one thing that we did not do on our reno because of weight was we wanted to put a big drawer in our outside bin, which was going to be made out of wood and we were gonna be able to pull this big drawer out and it was gonna be full of bins so we could get to the stuff that's way back in the middle from the outside, but it was too much wood and I kiboshed it because of that. Now, I was amazed how many of you commented about painting the RV. Like I said, I'm doing a whole video on that and the footage you will not believe. It is not easy. These rigs are uneven. You don't want to tape the walls. The paper on the walls eats the paint. It takes a lot more paint than you think. And I'm going to go through all of that. But today I wanted to answer this question from Mimi Johnson. Mimi Johnson, are you my Mimi Johnson? My Mimi? If not, it's another Mimi Johnson with the same name. Either way, hey Mimi. I watched one of your videos about not wanting to screw or nail anything into the walls. How did you decide on screw size and placement? I think this comment also said something about wanting to hang a curtain. Now, I have done videos before on hanging a curtain like the one I just talked about in my B plus van. You can take command hooks with, with little hooks on the end and actually get curtains with the big grommets and hang it that way so you don't have to put screws in. I never wanted to put screws in because you don't know where the plumbing or the electrical is inside of these rigs, but this time I did do it and I got more comfortable with it. But here's what I learned. First of all, you want to make sure that you don't use the screws that came with anything you're screwing in. Usually they suck. You want to go and get a short screw with a big nubby tooth on it. And when you put it into the wall, you want to make sure that it's where a wooden frame is. Now, these rigs are usually wood covered in aluminum. So you can find where there are pieces of wood inside of the wall, and then you just drill it in. Make sure that the screw is shorter than the wood you're going through. So like, don't use a screw that long on a wall that could poke outside your rig. Or like, we put a little carpet rail down here underneath the table and the screws that came with it were this long and we changed it to screws this big because we wouldn't be able to put our slide back in if the screws were too long. I have not had a problem and nothing is falling off like it was otherwise. And look, you guys know I'm a big proponent of command hooks, but I'll show you in my painting video, sometimes you put those command, oh, Wendy, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. Sometimes you put those command strips onto these walls, which is usually like plywood covered with a very thin kind of wallpaper. And when you pull them off, it can make the wall pucker. Like you see here, that happened to me a couple of times during my reno, and I had to find a way to fix it. So just because you're using a command strip doesn't mean it's not gonna do some damage to the wall, especially when they're covered with paper. I guess here's what I would say. First, I would try command strips. They're pretty good. Then I would try industrial Velcro, but that will wreck your wall if you don't want to put a screw in. But then I think short screws or nails are fine. If it's something you think is going to be on the wall for a really long time and you absolutely don't want it to fall while you're in motion. And finally, a lot of you asked if we're going to see more of Doug. Now, Doug does his own thing here. He's working but he is looking more at the videos and he kind of likes it. We didn't expect him to be on camera much, 
but I saw that you guys want to see his like a newbie RV experience. So he's been a gym, you guys. He's going to do an interview with us in a few weeks and we're gonna take footage of everything he's learning like dumping the black tanks and running out of power and all that good stuff. And again, thank you so much for being supportive and all the well wishes with Doug moving in. And if any of you have any advice about cats or screwing things into the wall or how to drive the fifth wheel, please do put them down in the comments below. I hope you're all doing great out there and staying healthy. I'll see you next Sunday. Until then, everybody have happy travels and be free.